a very short introduction. Uh, do we need a, I don't need a microwave. Oh, you got no, it. I think we'll be all right. Yeah. Can hear okay without yeah. the mic? Yeah. Oh, can. 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 You might not see you in the light. Yeah, under the spotlight. Just, under the spotlight. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I'm Kevin Garrett, and I don't come to Pinay very often. The last time I came was the uh, uh, jazz festival of two years ago. So uh, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to come to Pinay after after living in the very torrid conditions in Kuala Lumpur. You have know, the feel of the of the sea around you. Mm. And I'm very happy to finally meet up with Gareth. Like you said, we've got very many mutual friends. And Ari Finn, of course, uh, for many years, the group of Penang Aliran uh, fighters uh, have always been our, our, our idols in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, for having kept Aliran monthly going for so many years, it's really not an easy thing. So I'm finally uh, very glad to, to see him again. Um, I must confess to uh, having brought you here under false pretenses because I thought there was going to be a reform RC2. <laughs> because I remember Kit Siang uh, just last week or something saying uh, we're going to have a big campaign to save Malaysia, which is made up of patriotic and progressive people. All patriotic and progressive Malaysians will be brought together to save Malaysia. So actually, we've just found out that, that reform RC2 is not going to help. You think you, uh, shall I launch into the thing? Absolutely. Wait, so launch, take, take launch away. Yeah, instead of sending, I don't think you don't want it to stand you. No. Or do you want a small one? <laughs> <laughs> so, but what is really interesting, what has happened in the last week, is that with this, this citizen's declaration, it has, it has really split many young uh, involved in quite a few email uh, e-groups. And even Arifin was telling me, you know, in his groups as well, uh, there, are, there are splits. I've seen them. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, something from Malaysia actually. And in, in my e group, and uh, we have many different groups, uh, all, all uh, from Singapore or uh, uh, returnees from England, they are also split. So it's, very, it's a very interesting uh, issue that has arisen, and it's, it's well worth a, a discussion. And uh, probably there should be more in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, so, what I want to take us today is to look at this citizen declaration because my, my uh, record through the years and my obsession is not for all these slogans about this and that. You see, I'll, I'll bring you through the years of slogans, but my uh, obsession with real concrete reforms uh, has always been there. Just like Aliran has also, also been involved with what are the kind of reforms we ought to see in Malaysia to make it a, you know, a progressive country. So, uh, the one thing that comes up whenever anybody disagrees with Selamat Khan Malaysia is to say, wow, you cannot forgive this man, man. Gareth, you cannot forgive that man, man. You talk about him like, what, what, what? Huh? So it's always a question of forgiveness. But I'm more interested in impunity. Mm. Right? Aliran had been chasing Mahate through, he, he came into office in 1981 and he left in 2003. And during that time, he's created havoc besides uh, arresting and detaining someone like me, who I look like a threat to national security. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if, if, you, if you were with me in Operation Mala, even some people who are supposed to be there, because they joined a group called Juntullah, means the army of God. It's, it's really quite comical, you know. Some of these people, they don't look like threats to national security at all. And I, they, recently I met up with one, Kamu uh, Zaman Ismail, who was team twice. And what we have in common, uh, we, have, we built a fish pond together, we, uh, we were the same kung fu group together, and then we were looking at the stars together at night. You know? <laughs> this is what we do, uh, you know, when, when but this thing about forgiveness, you know, do I look like I'm, sometimes I'm, I frighten myself about how forgiving I am? Especially in recent years. When I was young, maybe no. <laughs> now I grow much older, I find that I'm very forgiving. But this kind of forgiveness is different. We're talking about impunity. And if you read that United Nations Commission on Human Rights 
uh, resolution in 2005. Find that impunity, getting away with impunity is uh, something very serious, is almost a violation of human rights. People who have been, uh, had their rights taken away from them, put in prison, tax base in this country, according to Barry Wayne, this man squandered more than 100 billion, okay, from 1981 to uh, 2003. So what happens? We forgive him, and that's the end of it. You know? That's why this question of impunity is a question not only put to Pakistan National, it's a question that is put to Pakistan Raya. I don't know if you, you remember as far back as uh, the Kajak move about two years ago, okay? When they're trying to get rid of Gali, they're running. And Saifuddin took up a file saying, if you don't resign, we're going to expose this file. We're supposed to contain files of corruption by Khalid Ibrahim, okay, the, the former MB of Salai Hall. And then when Khalid Ibrahim finally goes, what is happening in the file? What we know on the record is that this man has got these, these uh, corruption allegations in this file. Does it mean that it's forgotten? Does it mean that we forget all about what Mahathir has done? So this is what I want to, I want, to uh, want people to look at. It's not a question of forgiveness. And other people say, oh, yo, if these people who have been detained under ISA uh, can forgive him, uh, why can't you forgive him? We ordinary people, okay? First of all, I have been in ISA detention. And I know that people who have not been physically tortured, not everybody was physically tortured. I wasn't physically tortured. I know that Kitsia, Kitsia wasn't. I know that Warning wasn't. I know who has. has and there's, there's actually somebody from Benin. Uh, somebody with in the NGO world, who was when I first got on the bus to go to Kabunti and then we all took our black sunglasses off, he looked traumatized. So what he went through in the 60 days of solitary confinement you can imagine. And then you meet people like Joshua Jamaluddin. His his uh, his set in his uh, affidavit is in my uh, the back of my the back of my book. And then you read uh, Munawa Anis in on the in, on, can you still, still find it on, on the internet? I used during the time I, I could Google on the internet and see what he went through. And if these people can forgive Mahate, that's a different story. But many politicians who are detained under ISA, especially the bachelors, those that didn't have children, I mean hell of a time. If you're not physically tortured during 60 days. I think detention is actually a, a badge of honor for them as a politician, you know. So, so this question of forgiveness has to be seen in that light. Okay, and uh, Gareth said that I should say something about about my latest book. And basically, uh, I find that we're we're entering this this Orwellian devil speak, you know. Like I just said, uh, Kit Young says we want patriotic and progressive. Malaysians to save Malaysia. So, obviously, if Mahate wasn't patriotic and progressive, he wouldn't be asked to lead this campaign, would he? So, even that has become uh, relative. And then we have a threat to national security. I'm supposed to be a threat to national security. And I always bring up this, this, this very nice uh, irony. I was detained, uh, you see in, in here, uh, the first book here. No, no, this is. I'll, I'll go, go back to this very soon. But I want to say that the book before that, that book, second last book, was uh, I bring out some race free alternatives to national development in this country. So, again, you, you'll see at the end of my speech uh, a whole list of reforms that we want to see. But, uh, right. Amongst my allegations of facts under the ISA, because you don't, they, don't, they don't charge you in court. They give you these things for allegations of facts. And you have really get about three or four allegations of fact. And one of my allegations of fact is that I had drafted this joint declaration by the major Chinese associations in 1985. Look, this book is not banned. It was published by KDAS. I don't know if you ever remember KDAS. Uh, KDAS was one of the one of the most uh, outstanding journalists in this country used to be the bureau chief of the Far East Asian Economic Review. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 1994. And 
And uh, I was among my allegations of fact was I, I, I published this book. I drafted this book. This this uh, book as well as a joint declaration. But this book is not there. It is signed and endorsed by 27 major organizations, which means not just some you know Kukong C or whatever. It is a national uh, uh, alumni association. It's the National School Teachers. It's the National School Teachers Association. It's the National Federation of Chinese Assembly Halls. The fact that they endorse this thing is the more, more important thing, not because I drafted it. But that book is not banned, but I'm detained under the ISA as a threat to national security because of this book. And then you remember back in 1969, when Mahathir wrote The Malay Dilemma, which the Tunku and the Special Branch and the Home Ministry decided was subversive. You know, it cannot be publicly allowed to be published. It was banned. The Malay Dilemma was banned in 1969. So the book is banned. It's a threat to national security. But Mahathir is not arrested and detained. It's a threat to national security. You see the, the beautiful uh, contrast, the beautiful the irony of it? Okay. So I was detained this my book on my, my experience for 445 days. So I'm, I'm saying, can I forgive him for taking away 40, 445 days of my life? For missing out on seeing my children grow up and missing out on my family and friends? Is it, is it so easy for me to just forget it and say, you know, forgive this man for what he did? So this is what I'm talking about. And then in 1992, when I was a member of parliament, I, pre I published this book called Reforming Malaysia. Again, my obsession with reforms in this country. Concrete reforms. It's all in this book. Uh, this is interesting, not because I want to dig up old, old morals. Uh, I repeat, don't, don't get excited. <laughs> I, 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 just want to, I, I, I just want to highlight one thing. Was that in nine, before the general election of 1995, in the Central Executive Committee of the DAP, uh, are you sitting there? Oh, yeah, okay. We had this, this uh, disagreement because Kit Sang said that the Barasan National was already coming up with minor liberalizations. Our theme for the 1995 general election should be full liberalization. Said, doesn't make right. Doesn't. You're, you're like, I'll see you're telling the taxpayers, oh, this virus national is liberalizing, but we want more liberalization. It's, it's not a, it, it didn't ring right. I said we should have it as reform Malaysia and bring out all the things they want, all the alternatives that we want for this country. And that was the beginning of the end for me uh, and my friend Lee Ban Chen. And, and, and before long, I, was, I, was, I, was, I left the party. But what is interesting is that. Uh, when we left, the chairman of the party, the advisor of the party, was asked to talk to us to uh, persuade us to stay. But we we did. But on the way out, the chairman said, "You know what? I, I agree with you that it should be reform Malaysia and not the full liberalisation." So I said, "What the? What's the word get over this <laughs> Didn't you see that in the in the, 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 the CEC meeting? You know what are you telling me now? You know." So this, this is, again, this is a question that is, that is interesting because now, again, we have Selamatkan Malaysia or Reform Malaysia. And, okay, we go back to uh, Reform Asti, 1998. At that time, the demand was for Mahathir to resign because he was the, 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 the great uh, Mahathir Ram, you know, the great pharaoh. And uh, at that time, uh, Anwar's demands were to end colonialism and to end corruption. Uh, and then we go on the following year, before the 2000 general elections. Again, uh, if I'm arrested again, I would be charged with having drafted this suchu, which is the appeals of the... But both the German Declaration and the suchu, although they were endorsed and signed by the Chinese associations, you'd be surprised that it is a... It is a non-racial, uh, comprehensive uh, human rights, democracy, and uh, full reform of the country, which we know un unlike what I'll be showing you later on. And then we have 2007, which was the first birthday. Uh, the demands at the time were actually just about five 
free and fair elections on an indelible aim, voters' roll, abolish postal votes. That's the policy one. And then we have policy two in 2011. And the free and fair elections demands extended to eight demands. Uh, you know, besides that, we had other things about stock corruption and dirty politics and strengthening public institutions. Bursday 3, Bursday 3 was about the same as Bursday 2, again mainly on free and fair elections. Bursday 4 was the beginning, because I've been, I've been uh, criticizing that the lack of uh, reforms that Bursday was asking for. And so in Bursday 4, it was free and fair elections, clean government, right to the said, you know, strengthen parliament, there's one I wasn't very happy about, save the economy. Uh, it seems a bit, a bit blurred to me about save the economy. How do you say save the economy? And again, for the Prime Minister to resign. Uh, so that was in 2015. There was Najib, of course, to resign. Uh, so I, I just stopped there at those, uh, the whole trajectory of historical, trajectory of what people were asking for and what I was asking for and what the, the, the civil society was asking for. Before the last general election, civil society in Malaysia got together and had an agenda. And this is, this is what is, is uh, more concrete. They can be, they can be uh, locked together under about eight main demands. And there are certain, you'd be surprised some of these demands which have been the preoccupations since the 70s and the 80s are not talked about anymore. And racism and racial discrimination. An example is the, the new economic policy. What has happened to, uh, you know, people aren't talking about them anymore. Are everybody happy with them? I know that the Indian community, uh, especially, uh, are not very happy with this. Hindrab is still talking about that. But Hindrab is talking about uh, abolishing, uh, repealing uh, Article 153, the one that allows uh, uh, Special privileges, but then that is not all there is. We'll look, we'll look at it some, some later on. Now. So there's also human rights, environmental protection, fair education. This will come to the details about this progressive economic policy, and this involves a uh, progressive fiscal policy. Again, you see, you don't see Malaysian politicians talking about this in in America at the moment. The Republicans and the, the Democrats, all the candidates have to come out and de decide declare to the people what kind of fiscal policy they, they want to give to people. <coughs> Who is going to be taxed? Yeah. Are the Republicans going to be giving more, more tax deductions or are the Democrats going to be giving more? And so on. In Britain it's the same. Labour and Conservative have to come up with a position on that. But in this country, nobody talks about fiscal policy. That's very, that's very strange that, that they should have. And uh, we look at, this is still very, very blockish and uh, and this is more that I've got about 19 demands. And I don't want to kill you with, with a PowerPoint presentation or not death by PowerPoint. <laughs> I, want you to just, I just want you to look at the, the main demand and just glance at some of the ones I've, I've, I've highlighted, you know, like the NEP. And this is interesting, for example. Hendra is calling for the abolition of Article 153 on Malay privileges. I'm saying maybe. Amendment 8A, which was after May 13, when the country was being ruled by an emergency law and the martial law, that 8A amendment, which allowed the quota system to come in, was actually in 1971, not 1957. So people say, oh, the social contract. Social contract is 1957, so you're not 1971. So if you don't abolish 153, what about 8A? Can we agree to abolish AA that allows the quota system? <coughs> yeah, because if you look at it properly, actually, this question of whether it's the conflict with the constitution or not. I've written about it in my, I think my latest book. Uh, Merit based civil and armed service. Whatever you talk about affirmative action at the present moment, the armed services is at least 95, if not 98%, will be for sure. The civil service is at least 95%. Is that true? Are you telling me with 95%, 98% women push our domination? We still cannot have merit based and, uh, uh, enrollment in the civil service and the young service. You know, even if you don't want uh, merit based thing in, in education. And then uh, 
the marginalized and poor, of course, the, the Chinese community in this country uh, seem to have adapted to the LEP. You know? And then because it's, the Chinese the associates are led by all these elite people, uh, they know how to they know how to adapt as well. But there are, there are very serious consequences for the people, for example, who drop out from school. People think that all the Chinese are so clever, or oh, all get straight A's in SPM. But they don't know how many, a big percentage of the Chinese drop out of the SPM. Drop out and become what? You know, become pirate CD sellers in Pasar Malam that the, the moving trucks can make fun of. So why can't they, why can't these dropouts be persuaded, encouraged to join the technical colleges that we have, for example, in, the, in IUITM, the Mara Institute? Where do these people go? Where do the Indians go? You know? And the Indians are, are, are less because the, the community is, is, is more divided. Uh, the, the leadership and, and they, are, they are more at a, at a loose end. So the marginalized, especially in the last few years under Mahate, the urban settlers, the plantation workers have been driven up from their land and to become urban settlers in the, in the urban areas, marginalized and poor. What happened to them? This is what this is what uh, affirmative action is about. You know? Do we have it on race, or do we have it on income, or sector, or class? You can say the sector. I mean, recently, uh, was it uh, Jai Kumar of PSM was writing about how the, 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 the poor Malays can be helped. Fine, no problem. But they help as a sector. They help as a rural sector, as a farming sector, a particular farming sector. You know, whether in, whether in, in plantations or in, uh, in farming, whatever, it help as a sector. So that even if they're Indians or Chinese in that sector, they also get help. So it's not race. You know, is it beyond? Sometimes I wonder how, how come the country is supposed to be, we're supposed to be in the 20th, 21st century. And we can't think of a solution like that. So who, that is what all these things I write about racism and communalism and those kinds of all about racial discrimination. Means testing. Gareth knows that in England, when he went to university, you get a grant to go to university. You're means tested. If you come from an upper middle class, your parents are to, to uh, subsidize you. Right? I mean, if you come from a lower middle class, you can get the full grant. That's called means testing. The richer you are, the less your parents have to, the more your parents have to pay. The poorer you are, you can have a full grant. I got a full grant from the Inner London Education Authority to go to Manchester University. Because I was working in London as a laborer for three years, and I qualified for a full grant. Alcohol, racism, and Equality Act. In my latest book about moderates and uh, extremists, I talked about the Harmony Act that was that's supposed to come in to replace the Sedition Act. Now we know that the Sedition Act, Najib wanted to abolish, is still there and being used very profusely. But the Harmony Act, what was the Harmony Act? What's the Harmony Act? National Harmony Act. What is the act supposed to tell us about? I can be detained under, under uh, the ISA for being a uh, threat to national harmony. So you have a harmony act. What is the harmony going to do? What we want is an equality act, like we have in England, in UK. And what we want is if we already have a human rights commission in this country, in Suhaka. What they have in England is to have an equality and human rights commission. Because equality is basically human rights as well. You know, the, the, the lack of the lack of uh, discrimination in order to have equality that's part of human rights. Uh, and what is to stop the government uh, ratifying the International Commission on the Eradication of Racial Discrimination? If you do that, then you have certain laws you have to have in this country to ensure that there is equality. Okay. Uh, Third, human rights. Gareth, give me a warning if you, if you uh, okay. keep going. Because Arifin is going to uh, res discuss, respond to this, uh, so give him time as well. Human rights, detention without trial, very close to my heart. Uh, all the conventions, conventions against torture, and what happens at ISA and uh, so smart, today is so smart, and Poka and Porta. Remember this Porta, I go all over the country because I, I'm still part of Swaram that was formed after Operation Lala to ensure that we do not have detention without trial. Okay? 
but when the government, because of international terrorism, government has used the opportunity to bring in the Prevention of Terrorism Act. And they say, look, in the West they are having this, but you know that in the West, they do not detain without trial their own citizens. The Americans don't do that. They have Guantanamo Bay for, for foreigners. And they can't bring them into uh, America because America doesn't, doesn't have laws that allow detention without trial. So that's not true that the, the, in the West they all do that. Britain is the same. Britain doesn't have a law that allows detention without trial of their own citizens. They're trying to do what, what uh, the people who have been released from ISA detention are uh, restricted under a restriction law. You're restricted, you're born, born and raised to a forsaken place like Batu Bahad or uh, <laughs> And that's what they're doing in UK. Restrict you having maybe yeah. internet security, that kind of stuff. But not to detain the UK citizens under, without, without trial. Uh, uh, the recent problems about the civil and Sharia court, this kind of stuff, we desperately need a law reform commission to make sure that the, that the jurisdiction is very clear. Conventions against torture, I just said it. Conventions of refugees as well. Mm -hmm. Right this morning in, 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 in Kuala Lumpur, we caught the train, there was a refugee created quite a fuss. In this part of the world, I think it was your deputy prime chief minister, when the Rohingyas were, <coughs> were desperate and floating in the sea, what did he say? We do not want a, a, another project I see. Please stay out there. Uh, but we in Swara, uh, we've got a Swara Pinang program. One of our work is to help refugees, people who are desperate. And I, I really, I really uh, admire uh, Angela Merkel in Germany, uh, the, the open arms that she gives to, 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 to migrants who are desperate. So these, these are things that, whether you like it or not, are, are things that we have to do as people who respect human rights. Uh, corruption, everybody wants to eradicate corruption, but the MACC has to be answerable to Parliament. It has to be truly independent. Uh, it has to be chaired by an you know, opposition MP. And the revolving door, you know, I, I also came up with a book called Questioning Arms Spending. And you'd be surprised that the revolving door around not just the Defence Ministry, the armed services, but also the energy ministry, the energy services, TNB, etc. A revolving door in which when they retire, they become uh, directors of uh, private companies. It makes you wonder what happened in, when they were in, in the civil service or the armed service. And anybody uh, tendering for, for, for projects, did they give them any? So that, that, there has to be a rule. In fact, I think there is a civil service there is a civil service rule on this, but not has never been uh, been uh, in, in implemented very seriously. And every year, the Auditor General's report is reported in the papers now. It's less than before. And what happens? No ministry, no head of department is made responsible for it. Can there be something in, in our, our laws to ensure that the minister, minister and the head of department are made responsible for these? These errors. Yeah. Free and fair elections. I won't say very much, uh, but these, uh, some of these, some of these uh, reform proposals were were, were, were actually uh, contributed by different groups. This was contributed by by Bursi, of course, and even uh, some of the we will come later on, especially the one on fiscal policy. Uh, Lin Ma Hui from Penang was also very, very helpful uh, in giving some of his. Uh, accountable representative democracy. Limiting the office of the PM, the CM, the MP. Whether your, your, your chief minister's term has been restricted on. Yeah. <laughs> Election representatives. How long are these people going to be in office? Yeah. It's, oh, we want to have a quota for women. We are for women's rights. Women's Day was just a few days ago. We want a quota for women. And then these buggers uh, stay in order in the office for how long? They have we all must have you la, you're so great. You know, stay on please, they must you know. He's trying to avoid the answer that, to that question. Play around with that. Okay, you have plenty of time to to, to, to talk, I feel. 
You have to tell me when it's my time to stop. And uh, I'll keep I'll going, man. I'll, yeah. I'll stop you. Yeah. That's right. Uh, but whose time? Since uh, Razak's time? Since Hussein's time? Since uh, Badawi's time? Since Najib's time? And now Najib's going to go since, uh, I don't know, but Zahid's time. You know, <laughs> And this is a, it's a, it's a, I have been, I've been in politics as well, but the kind of, uh, and I was in, in slang as well, the kind of, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, in school we used to say, uh, cock and bull stories. Mm -hmm. Cock and bull stories, they say, when we was, when I was in slang all that, we had a, an MP there, and uh, the leadership said, oh, so and so has to be the, rep, the leader of the opposition in slang all. This guy has already got two practices. You know, he's a doctor, a specialist doctor. Two practices in PJ, in Kuala Lumpur. He's also a member of parliament for many terms. And then the great leader says, he has to be the leader of the opposition in Selangor. Why? We were saying, because we, we, I was in the Selangor uh, committee. Why? Well, because nobody can do that job. Nobody can do the job. At that time, uh, now uh, I think through the years, I think Deng Chang Kim is a. It's turned out to be a thorn in the flesh, isn't it? Another thorn in the flesh. Uh, so, this question of elected representatives, I think there has to be a, a limit on either four years or uh, four terms or five terms. 20 years? Not enough. <laughs> Never mind uh, what? 40 years, 50 years. Uh, declaring assets, you know, PSM. Uh, elected representatives have been declaring the assets. Why, why, why can't the other, the other big Pakatan Raya or Pakatan Harapan people do the same? And then, what does declaring assets mean? Or they declare their income. What about assets? What about the, your wife and your children's assets? No. Doesn't it include that? That's why we're, we're, not, we're not stupid. <laughs> uh, elected local governments, I find that uh, up to today, we still haven't seen very much of this. Freedom of expression and, and information, uh, we're all familiar with the Nation Act. Freedom of information, uh, I think uh, there's not much to say about this. Assembly, okay, I'll skip these. Huh? Give you workers' rights, you know, unionization, uh, for the labor laws to be more like the ILO uh, laws. Guaranteed minimum wage, find that it seems to be very difficult to have implement the government. In Britain they have done it, in many countries they have done it. Uh, if you don't want to have it, then you, 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 you have to have your foreign labour. Yes. And then you scream about the foreign labour because you don't want to increase your guaranteed min minimum wage. Where are we going? We want to have a high income, a high income uh, society by 2020, I think. You know? <coughs> How is it possible when, when this ding dong goes off? Uh, are we prepared to let workers have a uh, a bigger say in management, in, in corporate decisions. These are things that uh, women's rights and dignity. Uh, there are many. I think Malaysia is accredited with with having uh, ratified the CEDAW, which is the, the, the women's equal. What CEDAW stand for? Discrimination. Equal rights for women, etc. Discrimination. But then we haven't. Discrimination against women. Okay. Discrimination. We haven't actually. Uh, Put them into to uh, national our local national laws yet. Yeah. That, that is what has to be done. Uh, LGBT. You know, recently, I think uh, one of the it turned out there was a homophobic Superman in the, in, in in our community, and they, they very nastily uh, made some comments about my, my friend who is who is a columnist in, in Malaysia Kini. Uh, uh, just like a, just like a, just like a homophobic Superman, and uh, I think that that kind of stuff is actually a, a violation of the, the, the dignity and rights of, of the LGBT. And this is the guy that you see uh, in the election, general election. He goes up and down the country like a big hero of the DAP, you know, uh, uh, being a homophobic Superman. So uh, is that something that we want in an alternative society? Indigenous people's rights. Um, UNDRIP, United Nations uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. We haven't ratified it to give uh, to make it into, into our local national laws. Uh, every day we're still finding uh, Oranas, the Indigenous people in Sarawak, Sabah, challenging uh, things in court. 
they are challenging even the Kelantan uh, government in many of these uh, land issues. Education policy, I think uh, this question of discrimination is, is quite a serious one, like I said. I don't, I don't see how uh, uh, an institution like UITM, which is funded by taxpayers, cannot be open to all communities. Why can't it be open to all communities? Otherwise, whether the, 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 the Indians who are not academically inclined, or the Chinese who are not academically inclined, they try to tell me all the Chinese and all the Indians are academically inclined. Why can't they go to technical school? In fact, we're sitting next to a uh, uh, in the train, two people who went to the Penang Technical Institute in the old days. I said, you are lucky. I said, where do uh, latter-day uh, non boobies go to when they want technical educa education? Or, you know, private schools, maybe Tar College. Tar College is more, more uh, accountancy, business, that kind of IT, that kind of... What about if you want to do something like a mechanics uh, workshop? And that kind of stuff, you know, less academically inclined, less not full engineering but more of technical education. Where do they go? What can they go to UITM? And they, they always bring this question about the, the Chinese independent schools. The Chinese independent schools are open to all Malaysians. There are quite a few hundred uh, non Chinese, mainly Malays, in independent schools. And there are 80,000 non Chinese, mainly Malays in Chinese primary schools. There's no discrimination. If I invite, find any discrimination in any Chinese school, I'll be the first to speak up. But I, through the years, I, I haven't found, found any complaints from, uh, from the Bumitra community about the Chinese schools. And I know that uh, a Chinese school near my home in Ulumangat in Slaimov gives scholarships to Orang Asli uh, living in uh, Ulumangat. So uh, <coughs> what are these things? And this thing about mother tongue school, I'm, I'm very proud of one thing. In, uh, in recent years, I suddenly dawned on me that we can solve quite a lot of problems about segregation, about integration, about this big hoo-ha of English language being uh, the language of science and, and, and math. And that. It's to, if, 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 if English is the mother tongue of people living in Penang, of Petaling Jaya, or Johor Bahru, or Malacca, why can't they have their English schools? They won't, you won't have people in Kelantan saying, oh, my English is, is, my mother tongue is English. Or people in Sarawak will say, I, I want English school. The government can surely, selectively, allow these schools to be set up, because it is about this school, that English is the language they speak in the house. And I'm sure there are quite a few in Penang as well. In that way, you are, you are pacifying the people in Page, you know, pacifying the people in, 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 in other places. And at the same time, I, I really think I've been in, in the mother tongue language campaign for how many years? Chinese schools have been in this country for over 200 years. And through, you know, I, I, my, my first book when I came to, back to this country was the Chinese schools of Malaysia, a Tolkien saga. That's one time Proton saga just came out. <laughs> um, and, uh, at the time, what, what, was, what was of concern was this question about integrating themselves. There was a, a controversy that came out in 1985. And the, the solution was to have integrated activities. Integrated activities of all the different language streams. And I think that's a brilliant idea. All the new schools will have education precincts. The Malay school there, Indian school there, Chinese school there, English school there. And then we share our we share our very good facilities. We share our <coughs> IT facilities. We have fantastic theatre facilities. You know, we have fantastic sports facilities and so forth. <coughs> promoting integration, promoting uh, healthy competition. A progressive economic policy, I think uh, the question of nationalism, uh, nationalization is a question that we can help to find, uh, discuss in this country. In Britain, it's discussed a lot. Why should Mars, for example, be, uh, why should Mars be a, a, a corporation that is privatized? You know? 
in the 80s, and then bought over by the government, and then privatized again. Today we came up by KTM. KTM. KTM has been going for so long, and uh, <clears throat> we couldn't get it online. <laughs> we couldn't book. We couldn't book the ticket online. You know? what, what's wrong with KTM? KTM? Why can't we develop KTM into a, into a good national? Uh, what British Rail used to be? I'm not sure. You go back to it. British Rail has been privatized now, and, uh, and the price of tickets in rail tickets in England is exorbitant. I tell you, unless you book two years in advance. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, these questions that, that that we have to think about. You know, why can't we nationalize uh, KTM? It's already been privatized. TNB, one of the first corporations to be privatized in this country was Telecom in the 80s, mid 80s, and it was a profit making, belong to all of us, making profits and had to be privatized. Why? Because, yeah, because the, the great Pharaoh believed that it was, it was this, this cronyism, you know, this privatization to give these cronies, and this is what, this is how we lost money. Uh, <clears throat> so that's nationalization something we need to think about. Nowadays, we need, it'd be interesting because of the last crisis of capitalism in 2008, even in England, before that, you say, "Why well, you want to nationalize uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland? You're crazy, or what?" Some British might tell you. By 2008, RHB, RBS went bankrupt and was taken over by the government. It wasn't impossible anymore. It became, you know, like they still the the, the big, today we found who banker is getting tons of money even in this country. When the country, when the so there's a crisis of capitalism, the banks are being taken over, this, the, the top bankers are still, the CEOs are still getting thousands in bonuses. And the same in Britain, the same in Malaysia. Um, I think uh, the question of oil royalties has to be properly distributed to the people in uh, Sabah and, and, and Sabah. And, and, uh, then how much a percentage is, is to be, I think, has to be worked up by what is demanded by Sarawak and, and Sarawak. A fiscal policy, I was saying earlier on, you know, this simple, before, before uh, Thomas Piketty wrote his book on capital, yes, how many, two years ago, three years ago, yeah. people said, oh, wow, we haven't talked about redistribution, we haven't talked about progressive tax policy. When I was studying economics early in the 70s, you know, the most basic economic book that you study in, in, in O levels or A levels, progressive taxation is something you learn straight away. But now in this country, I'm not talking about it. Why is that? We all know that the Barisan National has always been, been backed by the <coughs> big corporations. But I think uh, Pakatan Riot has also been backed by it. So they're all competing. Mm -hmm. They're all competing. Uh, the, the, the big, the big corporations are backing two horses. So uh, that's why the question of the question of election financing, political financing, is very important. <coughs> so when this this scandal of Najib came up about the 2.6 billion, it's actually a question. It's an important question about political financing. Hey. That the uh, Pakatan Riot, Pakatan Harapan, whatever it is, has also got to answer. Okay. GSC, we know that, that uh, everybody has to pay for it. <laughs> yes. Environmental protection, I think uh, there, there has to be a political will. You know, we have seen uh, forest behind my house uh, be gazetted when it was gazetted by, by the Garrus and the Anne's uh, ancestors gazetted the forest in 1932. And then in Slango, uh, our chief minister, Mike Tyson, in, uh, in uh, 1992, de-gazetted it without anybody realizing it. And only when we found out that the, the, the forest was being blocked, we realized before long that the whole area was, was being developed. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great, uh, I'm a bird, uh, bird watching and an animal lover. So I find that in this country, the political will to, to protect animals from being killed 
as well as protecting animals from being harmed, is something that we, we need to have uh, proper laws and uh, regulations against. A social policy, and I, I really, I really, wherever you go, Barisan National Areas or Pakatan Areas, Penang, is still a, a question of housing for the rich and the middle class. You know? if, if a place like Singapore can, can solve that problem in, with, with the, the, the low middle class and the, the working class, I don't see why we can't do it here. Other you know? uh, <coughs> Uh, that is, they, they are the people who are vulnerable that they will forgive Mahate for what he has done throughout the 80s. Uh, public health system, see, health system is slowly being privatized. Yeah. Malaysia could be proud of a, a, not a bad public health system. Yeah. Jaya Kumar, uh, our MP for... Uh, so I support, will tell you, you know, uh, that, that, that through the years, I mean, we, we put the, the, the public, public hospitals as well. And then the, and the, the price is, is really quite reasonable. Public transport is, is still not very not, not very well uh, handled in this country. Uh, I was talking with Sekhi just now about a, a vibrant cultural policy. You know, just asking how, how how the Penang government is treating the uh, area. During the, the 80s, when the national culture policy was in full bloom, you know, uh, we were always talking about what the alternatives are. What kind of how can we ensure a vibrant and vibrant cultural climate in this country? So Penang is is is, is run by a state government. Selangor as well. What have they done for to, to create a more diverse and more vibrant cultural policy? What are we doing for our youth? You know, uh, funds for minority activities. <coughs> I've been involved with a lot of these uh, associations, and, and you're not. Considered national culture, and your activities are not funded. Reduced crime. We know our, we live we live in the shadow of the police fuel force in in Charas, and they spend all the time drilling and and, and uh, how to fight riots. Sometimes the, the tear gas falls into our taman. I mean, we can smell the tear gas. Uh, but that is what the, the the police fuel force is actually trained for the for the jungle. And they'll be the the, be the the perfect people to go and look, hunt the loggers, people who are logging illegally, people hunting tigers, people hunting elephants, and all that kind of. They are the perfect people, the people who are uh, responsible for the human trafficking on the Thai border. They are the pe police force are the perfect people to go and hunt these people instead of being trained to uh, we see them going out with the right right cars and all that too put down some peaceful demonstration in the following court. Uh, defense cut. Nobody seems interested in defense cut. A common friend of Gareth and, and myself is somebody in the Institute of Peace Bureau in Geneva. And every year in, in April, when the when CIPRI, which is the strategic Swedish Swedish is a, is a strategic international uh, Peace, Research Peace Research Institute. Research Institute. Mm -hmm. They publish the annual figures on arms spending throughout the world. And on that year, uh, Swaram in Kuala Lumpur, uh, with other NGOs, come up with a, 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 at least a statement or a, a, an activity to highlight this issue. Defense cuts, why, why, why are they? Why are I, when we were on a campaign about stopping submarine and Alton Tuya, I was asking these Pakat these Pakatanaraya people, uh, MPs and, and representatives, what is your what is your defense policy? Are you going to implement any defense cuts? Our country spends something like two percent of our GDP on defense, which is something more than ten billion. More than ten billion. Can you buy the ten billion? The government is always any election comes to say they're built. One, you know, the MCA tells you that we built one Chinese school in the last year or the last four years. One Chinese school. <laughs> I don't know, you know, the, the, the figures of it. To build, a, in go to, you go to phrases here. The Chinese primary school there has got about two classrooms or four classrooms, and for many years the Chinese primary school there was almost ninety percent Indian. Indians in the Chinese primary school. 
So how much does it cost to build that Chinese primary school in, in Bukit Fraser? One million? So with 10 million of defense spending, how many schools can you build with 10 million? Maybe you didn't study math and science in English, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many can you build? 10,000 10, schools, right? 10,000 schools is the total number of schools in Malaysia. About uh, 10,000. At Independence, when the population of the Chinese and the Indians were half what they were now, there was 1,500 Chinese primary schools, 880 Tamil primary schools, 1957. Today, with the population double, there's 1,280 1, Chinese primary schools and 550 Tamil schools, Tamil schools. So is there any opportunity for the Barista National to say, hurrah, we built one Chinese primary school when the election comes? It's ridiculous. Isn't it ridiculous? What you can, what you can, what you can build with, uh, with 1 billion uh, so, so, so much for Najib's 2.6 billion Okay, so I think uh, this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of reforms we should be interested in in this country. And uh, the, the flimsiness of a slogan like Selamat Khan Malaysia. And we don't want anything else, uh, don't ask me to release Anwar. Because Anwar is not part of the picture. We want Najib out. That's all we want. So Mahathir can't even bring himself to ask for the release of Anwar. Never mind all these reforms that I'm talking about. So this is what I've come to discuss with you today. And I'm sure uh, you, you all have many... Uh, this, this issue is not a, a unanimous kind of decision. Many people have many different views on this. So thank you uh, for coming to this. The Malaysian obsession on both sides of the political divide seems to be restricted entirely to the politics of personality and high politics. So if at all there's a discourse, discourse or a debate going on, it might be at the level of elections, it might be at the level of some institutional reform, and certainly of political leadership. But the overwhelming majority, the substance of the day-to-day policy making and politics, of social reform, fiscal and macroeconomic reform, international uh, relations, defense, and so on. These are actually totally absent in the general political discourse. And later on in questions, I'd like you perhaps to elaborate on why you think that may be the case. The second observation is that a tremendous amount of the discrimination that takes place vis-a-vis -vis particularly discriminated against groups. You've mentioned refugees, women, uh, LGTB and uh, indigenous people and so on. Malaysia has never domestically ratified the international conventions to which as a member of the United Nations and particularly at the moment as a member of the Security Council you would think it would be its obligation. I was slightly not irritated, but I was slightly strange that you kept on mentioning Britain as a counterexample. If we look closer to home in the region, one would have to say that countries like the Philippines and Indonesia have taken a far greater uh, step in terms of, especially the Philippines and even Indonesia to a certain extent, into actually ratifying domestically many of these international obligations and Treaty. So these are some of the questions that maybe we'll bear in mind. Now, he's a professional outsider and has been for 40 years. Now we come to this man, this very ambiguous man, uh, on my immediate right. Because on the one hand, of course, he too, great scholar, radical scholar, and so on. But he's decided to enter the lion's den over the last five years. And indeed, he represents us. Uh, in Penang in the Senate and it will be fascinating to see how Arafin responds to uh, Sung's 19 point revolutionary program for change. Arafin. Thank you for a very enlightening uh, exposition on uh, what 
must be done in Malaysia and what are the challenges that we face. Actually, if I were to go and, and say on a point by point basis, I don't think I'll be able to have much time to discuss with you my perspective, which in a way is quite different from the perspective that the Quad has proposed to you. I don't deny what he says is true. All those problems and inventions stand out and start really. But I like to put forward one very interesting suggestion. Let us say this country is facing an innovation. We have a threat, an external threat. Okay. We have a threat uh, of your, your, law, your voice isn't as loud as him. You're very, very soft. <laughs> so the guys at the back are saying, please use the voice. Now, I want to follow one politician. If we are facing an invasion, a real foreign threat to this country, I'd like you to ask yourself who would set up the defense of this country? You see, the reason why I pose this question to you is because we are so riven by ethnic divisions. Never in the history of this country have we faced such divisions as, as we have faced now. At the time of Murneka, I remember vividly <coughs> the issue of ethnicity and race was not that serious. I had no problems with my students in Zinzinius. We didn't look upon each other as Malays or Chinese or Indians. I went to their houses, I slept, I ate at their table. There was no issue or question of whether the food was halal or not. They knew what I could eat. And what and we respected each other's religion and culture. But today it's reached such a stage that we are so hesitant to visit each other. Even to go to a house of worship, we did twice. And I went to St. Zinrius, studied it. I went to the cathedral, there's no problem. Nobody said that I would cease to be a Muslim. And there were friends of mine who went to see what a mosque was like. I even spent time in a Buddhist temple. So, when we look at the context of what Dr. Kwa has presented, one thing that comes to my mind is we have got to go to the basics. Let us look at the Constitution of 1927. What did it really stood for? You see, in my research, I believe that that Constitution, before it was uh, altered beyond recognition, was aimed at promoting a sense of Malayan identity. Now, if you are as old as myself, if you remember what your primary school education was like, we had heroes that we held up and respected. I'm sure some of you would heard of Bhut Chan Singh. He was not a singer who fought against the Japanese. Limbo Singh. Even Sajjan Jamaluni who fought against the communists. These were the heroes. They cut across the ethnic divide. They are not even mentioned. Who knows of single Kirigusu? Very few. But these were the people that we studied about. Their contributions. People that we were told to emulate. Who loved the country. Who fought for the country. Who worked to bring down the enemy that occupied the land. That's why I pose this question. If the country is under threat today, who is going to stand up to defend this country? Do you really believe for a moment that the Malays will do so. I'm not very sure myself. And frankly, if I, I look at the non Malays, why should they defend this country? What is that difference? When you are treated as a second class citizen, they're not even given the rights that you deserve, and try with the constitution. Every attempt by the government is to disenfranchise you of what you're entitled to. What is that defend? Who is going to defend the system? Now, why have we come to such a state? 
All the problems that we discussed by Dr. Park can be solved if we can overcome one basic problem. And that problem is ethnicity and racialism in this country. How do we go about it? Let's see. To me, the first step is dismantling the race-based parties in this country. And that really is a formidable task. I've been campaigning against race-based parties for years and years and years since I was in the Iran. I used to join Amro because I saw it as a race party. Now, of course, some of my friends tell us, what are you doing in the day? Is it a multi ethnic party? Well, I believe that it has the potential to develop into a multi ethnic party. At the point when I joined it, today, to be very honest with you, I'm not so sure. <laughs> no, honestly, I can be very honest. I'm not very sure myself. To me, it's taking too long. And uh, I think many in the DAP are so comfortable in their comfort zone, they're not willing to get out of it and to face the challenges that you face. And of course, the DAP will always remain an urban based party, maybe because it's not making much of an effort to get into the rural areas to get more support. Of course, the argument is that we can't go in. Let's have no stronghold, let's pass stronghold. But if we don't make the effort, how are you going to get across? And Malays are not going to join you willingly unless you're sure that you do care and you make the effort to reach out to them. It cuts both ways. I'm against also the NDP. To me, the NDP is a perfect recipe for cronyism, nepotism, and corruption. True, Article 150 in the Constitution does provide for Malay special rights, but read that article very carefully. Those special rights are very, very limited. Very limited, believe me. Scholarships and jobs. It doesn't mean that you take over businesses, you take over franchises, you deprive the non malays of what is their basic right. No. But ever since 1971, there were changes. And those were the changes that allowed the rights of the non malays to encroach upon. And uh, this encroachment seems to continue without stop. What do we do? put an end to such a very serious state of affairs. I don't think for a moment that we... Uh... Thank you, I hope this one leaves on. I don't believe for a moment that a beautiful uh, people's, what is it, struggle or whatever they call it, agreement, signed by Mahathir, and those who think like him, what in fact much changes. In fact, I'm very, very pessimistic. To me, it's going to be one of a series of failures. Why? Because we are putting our, our hands, our faith in the hands of people who have failed to deliver. And they have consistently failed to deliver. The hope of changes lies basically in the hands of individuals like you, like me, coming together and forcing those changes. How do we do about How do we do about we need? There has to be a sense of awareness of what is at stake and what is wrong in this country. Very, very often, and this is the tragedy of many of us, we fall into the ethnic trap of looking at things from an ethnic perspective. We have to get rid of that. I oppose the NEP because I believe there's a better alternative to the NEP. Many Malay racists or Malay nationalists have come around and without the NEP, at least I think. No! If you decide to take affirmative action based on income, the majority who will get the aid will still be police. You don't need to specifically make it a rule that only police should get the aid and the rest are left by the website. This is not the way to go. Now, coming back, how do we find the means to say this? I think we have to go back to the constitution, the original constitution, when it was first promulgated. Look at it, see what has been done to damage it and undo the damages. The reason why I, I say that we have to go back to the original constitution and undo the damages is because if you want to suggest something new, you will not get it. At least we are familiar with that constitution. We can undo the damages done by the Barisan National Amdo Land. It can be done. If you want to have a rewriting of 
a new constitution is not going to work. And I fear, and I really fear, that the country will fall into civil chaos. The other thing is, we have to make sure that the country is not divided according to religion. I cannot understand how, in the 21st century, religion should play a role in state politics. In fact, religion should be in the private domain. If we look at the original Malay constitution, the provision for Islam is just a religion of the federation, that's all. Basically, if you want to argue that it's a secular state, you are correct. But then the argument can also be made that it's not a secular state. But that does not make it an Islamic state. And if you go back to the original constitution, you will find that civil law takes precedence over Sharia law. Who changed it? Not other than Mahathir himself. So when we look at what happened to this country over this period of time when he was in power, we can see the sure and sturdy disintegration of the institutions of state. None of the changes that Dr. Kwa talks about can work unless the institutions of state are reinvented. We need very important what we need an independent division. We need a civil service that is not one-sided and biased towards the ruling law. Let me tell you, in the day we took old men, we took one hell of a time to re-educate the state civil service that is no longer the UMNO government as in power. And believe me, that was a massive effort. It's only in this second term that we are beginning to see some results. But we've still got a long way to go. But you're looking at the whole country. What do you do there? So everything has to be done step by step. The next point is education. I'm not against Chinese schools and I think we should have them. It was agreed to in the constitution. Don't do away with it. But at least maintain the quality of education. This was allowed to slide. Maybe because I'm not wishes to paddle the idea that in order to ensure that more and more Malaysians are sick, going through universities will bring down the quality of education. And the net result is none of our universities are any world class. And what's even more frightful, that our degrees are not recognized. You take a Malaysian degree and go abroad to look for a job, you'll be in trouble. You won't get a job. So those of us who can afford it will send their children overseas, get a degree from outside, and tell the kid, well, when you find a job, even if you don't come back, it's a matter. That is precisely what is happening. We are actually facing a major brain drain. In the past, the government used to say, well, what do we care? Basically, it's the non malays who are running off, we don't care to foods. But recently, when I raised this question in Parliament, though they will not admit it openly, it is far, we have been finding out that even Malays are running away from this country. Now, what do you say to that? And that is not all. The change in this country must be total. It's not just education that is important, it's also economics. The whole country actually is now monopolized by an oligarchy. The 1.5 million Bangladeshis that are coming here to work. Has anybody thought about the impact will have on the employment market, on labor? Why do we need to bring in the 1.5 million? Maybe because the cronies linked to the government want to ensure that their profits remain high high. So they are more than willing to allow Malaysians to be unemployed, but they are prepared to be in Bangladesh to give them slave wages, slave wages. And these people are prepared to work for slave wages. There are, there are rented houses in Penang where there are 40 or 50 Bangladeshis living there. That's the condition that they are prepared to live in. Which Malaysian is prepared to stay under such conditions? Now, this is a government that is prepared to sacrifice the interests of the country and the people for the sake of the few within the economic system. This has to stop. Now, I tell you very frankly, the DAP government in Penang, even though it tries to be above all this, cannot escape. For example, some of the major projects in this island, whether you like it or not, have to be given to this capitalistic monopolist. We have no option. The reality of it is there. Why? Because if you don't, then you'll be subjected to central government pressure. Tremendous pressure. 
one of the major impediments in these countries, you look at the power of the federal government recently, the power of the state. The states are basically powerless. The federal government calls the shots. If I were to tell you that the budget for University Science in Asia is one and a half times more than what they give to the state of Penang, you'll be shocked. But that's the reality of it. So, this is what we face. Now, as I mentioned, the judiciary, the civil service, and more importantly, the army has also got to be made multiracial. Now, why did the government fill the civil service completely with Malays, the army with Malays, and why did they maintain Mara? and all the other colleges and try to make them Malay monarchs. I think it must be a minority. If you look at the Malay psyche as seen by AMLO, they are behaving like a beleaguered minority, though they are actually the majority. Am I correct in this? Yes, you can see that. So, we are talking of special privileges. Actually, the special privilege should be given to the minorities, not to the majority. What is happening here? Why? Psychologically, this is what the AMLO Indian government is promoting. And I've also noticed a very clever and genius policy to keep the police stupid, uneducated, and politically ignorant. And this is a policy we are going to maintain no matter what. So the very, very few Malays that are liberated and are able to challenge them will always be the minority. And if they are not going to join AMLO, they have got to join the opposition. And if they join the opposition, their numbers are not big enough to make for that difference. This is the reality that we face in this country. Now, I really do not know how long we can carry on. My belief is that this, the changes pro proposed in the uh, declaration signed recently by Mahathir and those who are willing to work with him is not <coughs> First and foremost, I cannot trust my own. <laughs> my own personal experience. In 1987, I had to flee for my life when he launched Operation Dana. For three weeks, I was living from, uh, from one cemetery to another. You know, that was the only place where I could get shelter. I slept, of course, keeping from the side company the first time. The lovely Country and Northern Road. And then I realized that it was a small place and it was easy to find. So the best place to go was to the Mount Eskin Cemetery. So huge. <laughs> <laughs> you will need a division to look for me there. And even then, after a while, I ran out of time. My last resort was with the Tunku. And he took me and stayed with him for about a week before he felt that he was not safe. Don't forget, if now Najib is thinking of putting Mahathir behind bars, at that time Mahathir was thinking of putting the Tungu behind bars. <laughs> so the Tungu told me, look, I cannot protect you anymore, I'm going to get you out. And I remember being put in the boot of his car, driven through his gate with special branch looking with a torch into the car, all the way to Tanjung Bunga where he had his bungalow, and being put on a fishing boat to go to some highlight. You see? Where I stayed for two weeks. <laughs> I stayed for two weeks in a Buddhist temple. So every morning you used to wake me up and say, say your prayers. <laughs> so today if I say oh money but may own then you know where I am. <laughs> that was my experience of my life. And how can I forget? My wife didn't even know whether I was alive. And finally, when I went back home. My son, who was about nine months old, refused to talk to me for more than six months. Today they are grown up and they have chosen that they are not going to stay in the nation. And all three of them, because of this experience, decided that this country is a bad bad. And they are left. Because they do not see any future. And this is the young generation. I chose to stay here for one reason. I believe that we can change collectively. And finally, let me see. If this country falls apart, it's not because the whole country is filled with people who are evil. It is because those who are good and could have made the difference chose to remain silent and did nothing. 
or the rock by dawn in this country. Thank you. Get round to the story. But the, he, he left out a very nice part because he he's there with Tunku, you know, having uh, slept in the cemetery and you know all the hantu hantu chasing him. <laughs> <laughs> he got to Tunku. Of course, what does Tunku do? But welcome him. Of course, Tunku opens a, a bottle of malt whiskey. <laughs> this part. And then of course in these days he's this young, he, he, didn't, he didn't have grey hair, didn't look so eminent, he was this young, earnest scholar who would be soon going off to uh, ANU and writing his famous uh, book, Bang Samalai. He was this young, earnest scholar, there's Tunku, so he, the whiskey is flowing, Tunku's flowing, and so on and so on. But when it was time to leave and jump in the boot of the car, this guy wanted to publish, Tunku one day he wanted to publish it, and Tunku looked at him and said, we never met. <laughs> <laughs> but interesting how the personal stories, both with uh, Song and Arafin, and I'm glad he mentioned at the end the whole question of the, the brain drain, these three <coughs> extremely able children, and uh, Malaysia bore all the costs of social reproduction and education and so on. But there they are in Chicago, Brisbane, and Singapore. Am I right? Chicago, Brisbane, and Singapore. Well, well my son is in Chicago. My youngest daughter is in Brisbane. My eldest is uh, working in Singapore. That's right. I've got it right. <laughs> um, two things that strike me. I mean, you spoke about your skepticism, at least, in relationship to the <coughs> declaration that was made. Uh, and, and so you, you didn't speak so much to that question, so I, I'd probably like to open up by getting you to reflect on the declaration a little bit more tightly. But I was struck by your very first slide. Thomas Fuller, who was the Southeast Asian correspondent of the New York Times for more than a dozen years, um, just uh, retired from his post as a Southeast Asian correspondent, and he's gone to take a desk job in New York, and he decided to write one last big piece, looking back at 12 years here in Southeast Asia. And you may or may not be surprised that he said, one motif that runs across the whole of the Southeast Asian region, and he mentioned in, in passing from Brunei to the Philippines with the, by the way, it looks like 30 years on the comeback of Marcos Jr. Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and so on. The one motif, despite all the divergences and differences, was the word elite impunity. And that's the word, that's, that's how he headlined his story. So I, I found it fascinating. And I do think that that's a kind of um, deep-rooted institutional, political, and structural impediment to a great deal of the 19-point agenda that you laid before us. Um, so I think that's a kind of riff that I might want you also to uh, uh, think about uh, as we go through the discussion. Now I'm sure there's lots and lots of questions uh, either to Sung or to Arifin or indeed uh, to both of them together. I think we also have, I should say, um, some other jailbirds uh, amongst us tonight. In fact, uh, I've decided on a new editorial policy. Uh, those m Many of you know that besides the bookshop, uh, I edit, which is actually another way of making other people look very good. But I have a new policy. I will only edit if you've spent some time in prison <laughs> or a cemetery, okay? <laughs> I, I, I allow for cemetery. Uh, so, so I fully expect your next book to come to my editorial desk for the red pen before you go to the publishing. Let's open up with two or three questions from the floor, uh, if we may. I'm slightly facetious. I'm an anthropologist. I look for the details. I am just wondering why you want to condemn poor, underprivileged Chinese and Indian youths to UITM. I mean, what have they done? <laughs> <laughs> I would rather, I mean, the government already has these community colleges, and I think it's a fantastic idea. I don't know what the admissions policies to those places are, but I travel Sarawak interiors, Kelantan interior, Pahang interior, and the one problem facing communities is brain drain. We talk about brain drain out of the country, but keeping young people in the community is a major problem. 
But I think that you want radical change, you have to start at those levels. And I think that community colleges where the courses are geared towards local needs, community needs, community sustainability, what people need with community consultation, that's the way to go. Not sending them to these half-baked so-called institutes in KL or Shah Alam or wherever. Of course, you have to remember, uh, some of us in this room are uh, <coughs> die-in-the-wall Marxists, meaning uh, Groucho Marx, <laughs> who famously said, you know, uh, I wouldn't join any club that would have me as a member. So I think that's what you mean by UITM. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> but no thanks. So. Good evening. I think... Uh, the legacy that Dr. Mahathir will leave behind, in my opinion, is that he single-handedly destroyed Malaysia as a nation in every aspect. And there's one peculiar uh, fact about Mahathir that perhaps underlies a lot of what he did. See, if you look at social engineering in most societies, social engineering is in favor of the poor. But Mahathir was obsessed with this idea of creating Malay millionaires to compete with non-Malay millionaires. I don't think you can find any government dedicated to creating millionaires. And that led to cronyism. I mean, he used so many labels to hide his uh, true obsession, privatization, all this. But actually, when you look at it, there were very few civil servants who were capable of standing up. One of the worst cases was uh, privatization of power plants. YTL was allowed to sell power to Tanaga at 14 and a half cents. A lot of young people would not remember. When Tanaga could generate electricity at 8 cents, and when Anil refused to sign, he had to resign. Now the other thing about Mahathir, he doesn't have double standards. I don't know how many, hundreds of standards. Now it is convenient for him to talk about rule of law. But I remember very clearly when he was asked about Anwar Ibrahim uh, and the judicial process, he said, in my mind, I'm satisfied that Anwar is guilty. I mean, we can talk about Mahathir. Although I have not been directly affected by Mahathir, I don't think I can forgive him. Okay. I'll take uh, front row, yes. Now is your chance. How is my time? The question to both uh, Professor Poy and uh, Senator Amphit. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, contents that you shared just now was uh, about local government acts. So uh, my question is, how does the 13 member states gain more autonomy since we're, we're a federalism? How does each member state gain more autonomy and have more um, administrative power to take care of ourselves? Yeah. Okay. That's the question. I thought you had two. You had two questions? Yeah. Oh, just one. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna... I'm gonna... <coughs> Correct me if the figures are wrong. When I did uh, Gomez and uh, Johan's NEP book, that's about three years ago, I believe that the budget division in this country was 92% to the federal and the other 8% spread around the other 13 states. It's something of that order. And even if it's slightly improved, you're talking about the order of 9 to 1 uh, in terms of just poor, poor I was budgets. thinking about 50-50. No. no, 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 we're here. No, we're here. No, we're here. No, we're here. So we've got yeah. questions around community education and so on. I don't trust Anwar. Oh. Anwar. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, uh, Mahathir, as far as I can throw him. The man not with double standards. I like that line, I might use it. The man with handy, handy standards? <laughs> Hundreds of standards. Uh, and the question of the, the cronyism of... And, and, you, and you said the sort of institutional dysfunctionality, even of the civil service, people not being able to stand up to him, and then the whole question of federalism and more power to the states. So. Yeah, I mean, the question about I, why I brought up UITM is that <clears throat> UITM is such an extreme example of blatant racial discrimination. 
because the minister actually said, as long as you know, the Amno General Assembly, as long as I'm the minister, I will not allow a single non bumi putra to enter UITM. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's very, it's very well, it's very well for us to say that we don't want. To, who wants to go to UITM? I don't want to go to UITM. But think of the number of people who are not academically inclined. We're just talking about UITM is a symbol, you know. UITM is a symbol of uh, uh, institution that is supported by all Malaysian taxpayers, which could be a possible avenue for people who are not academically inclined. And and if this minister says not one single non can he's going to be he's going to be if, if we ratified the ICERD, he'd be taken in, you know, for blatant racial. If we had an Equality and Human Rights Commission, he'd be taken in straight away. Community colleges, etc. I think my wife worked in a Mara Science College before. Although it's not 100% Bumi Mutra, I actually in my one of my, my reforming Malaysia book was statistics when I was a member of parliament. I got about how many percent? And there are more than 95% who are accepted into these community college, science colleges, science Mara colleges, etc. More than 95%. So, why not? I'm in favor of, of, of all these colleges accepting, uh, but I'm more concerned about the people who are left out of the system. The dropouts from the, the Chinese dropouts, the, the Indian dropouts, who have nowhere to go. That's what I mean. I'm not talking about Mara science, not the junior colleges talking about tertiary, but they're called college communities. <coughs> and what is the, as, as far as I know, the, the percentage of Wimbutras there is also very high. Yeah. No, Unless in they my... have them in, in, in the interior far away, so it's, uh, it reflects the local population. Yeah, but okay. Yeah. It reflects, if, but if, it's good before Wimbutra, so if, if it's in, uh, if it's in uh, Sarawak or Sabah, the indigenous people of, of there will qualify. Mm -hmm. Because in Kuala Lumpur, or Penang or whatever it is, uh, that's why we're talking to these people from Penang Institute, Technical Institute today on the, on the train. There's no chance. There's no chance. You know, it's all almost completely moving the truck. But why does it have to be completely moving the truck? Or 95% moving the truck? You know? Of course, I would, I would say that we want as many, all institutions, not just UITM or whatever, we want all institutions in Malaysia to be open to all ethnic groups. You know, that's it. The Nagar National, I've actually written a book called uh, Damn, Damn, and Noxious Newt for Energy. And uh, many, when I was a member of parliament, uh, I was in charge of uh, energy policy. And there are many examples in there about how, uh, uh, what, what the TNB was forced to do, and then the IPPs were, were brought in by Mahathir as well. Uh, you brought up uh, state autonomy. State autonomy, of course. I'm very more concerned about uh, this question of royalties, oil royal royalties for Sabah and Sarawak and, and even, even Trigano and, uh, and you know, uh, they deserve more than, than what they have been given in 5% all these years. You know? uh, so in, in places like Scotland, they it, it can get much more than that. And, and there's much more than that. And how much proportion, of course, we, you know, when I'm talking about local government, I'm talking about really local government like, uh, like Georgetown. You know? And that kind of local government. For the whole state, of course, we, we want we want a state to, to have a, a smart and, and even decentralized uh, services like education, health, police, etc. A very a very funny example, a very ironic example is that uh, the state government couldn't even um, have the power to take care of the old, their own public transportation. It has to be planned by somebody out there far away in Putrajaya planning about the routes and buses here in Penang. It's just really ridiculous. That's right. Yeah, we don't care. We want to decide where a bus stop should be cycled. We decided it's just a giant, not here. How do they know? What do they care? <laughs> 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 the example of where I'm staying in uh, Sahara, a lady came up to me and was abusing me because the bus stop was cycled in front of my house. They said, what's the bloody state government crazy? Do you know this? I said, okay, we have no sin. It's now by the federal government. And you know, it took me a lot of time to convince uh, that it was not state <laughs> And how, how can we get back the same? How do you get The only way to have this delusion of power is to take over the There is no other way. 
you've you just been sent and you don't take the sample. That thing is weak. But one point that I, I, I've been trying to uh, stress in bringing up this concrete agenda for concrete reform as well. Whenever there's a general election, these issues should be, be of concern by the citizens to ensure that the alternative government that comes in will change things. But if Malaysians are not putting that pressure on the alternative government, now, do you, do you see the Pakistan writer of Pakistan having a stand on, on NP? People say, oh yeah, the thing, I know Ibrahim came and said that there'll be no NP. But I, I plow through all their buku jinga, etc. I can't find it. Go in Google today. Okay? Stand of uh, uh, Pakatan Harapan on NEP. See if you can find it. And I'll eat my words. I'll eat before you. I'll eat those words. <laughs> uh, you know, these, these are things that we're concerned about. Fiscal policy. If you don't put any pressure on Pakatan Rakyat, Pakatan Harapan, when they come into government, what comeback have you got? <coughs> we didn't promise you. Who are you asking me this? Well, if I may add, the problem we have here is that we look at our position. It's been a very, very dismal state. I mean, it's so fragmented, and they don't even have a common aim. We all Pakata Rakyat. One component wanted Hudu and Bridia, most to Hudu, but they are not willing to give up. And the other one is a secular state, and I'm supporting a secular state. How do you have that? One portion wants to have, you know, multilingualism, the other no, just Bahasa Malaysia. Okay. This is this is the problem that we have this. <coughs> the opposition itself is not united on the issues that they should come together and have a common agreement. And it's the same thing today, this is what we are facing. And it is a major problem. You see, as for the Bahasa National, Frankly, other than Amlo, Amlo Baro, the rest don't count for anything. They are just hanging on, that's all. You know, the MC could be dead for all that matters. Or for the Gerakan Monument, or the MIC also. Amlo by itself can really run, run the country. They don't need these people. So, what is there for them to make compromises? But the trouble is in the Pakatan Rakyat, not Pakatan Harapan. There's got to be you know, some degree of you take the point is how much you want to give and how much you want to take, and how much can you agree on points together. Arifin, a question from me to you. Why is it though that there's just such an absence of any public discourse, not on some of the, let's say, second order reforms, that's just, I, I mean, they're all important, but the second order reforms that Sun was talking about, but at its heart, fiscal policy, macroeconomic policy, trade policy, TPPA, for example, is it because there are no common grounds? Let's say not across the coalition, even inside your own party. Ergo, let's not talk about it at all. But although you made a thesis to say uh, <clears throat> the kind of sine qua non, without which nothing else will happen, is, is, is the dismantling of, of race and ethnicity and the policies and institutions uh, that follow from that, I see absolutely nothing in the public agenda on core issues of economic and fiscal policy and so on and so on. Again, not to use an example of the United States election or Great Britain. Philippines. Philippines is just about to have uh, major presidential and senatorial elections. Every candidate in the Philippines has to give its line, for example, of broad economic policy, international relations, fiscal policy, reproductive health policy, etc., etc. You know, I mean, maybe it's the nature of the Filipino press, which is a very lively press, but they're interrogated upon and expected to answer. Yes, we know there's a lot of populism. Yes, we know there's pork barrel and all the rest of it. But there's something there in relationship to differentiating candidates and indeed political parties from one another on the basis of policy. I just simply don't see this. And you wouldn't expect this in UMNO BN, but the opposition? I mean, at most it's kind of those, it, 
It's cultural politics by another means. So yes, it's hooded or not hooded, secular or not secular, you know, religious relations and so on and so on. But in the hardcore policies that may enable an alternative government to deliver on at least a dozen of those sets of proposals, I see nothing. And I see nothing at the top level of your political party. Very good question. Okay, this is a very, very honest answer. I can afford to be honest because firstly I'm not beholden to anybody. The DAP ought to anybody. In the first place, you do not expect the DAP to come up down with the nitty gritty of what they want to do economically for the simple reason. Ask yourself where quite a lot of their funding comes from. You have to be realistic about it. The funding, this is what matters most. So if the MC was receiving that kind of funding in the past, it's coming to us. Now you are going to bite the hand that feeds you, it's going to be a very dangerous thing. Now if you want a really good exposition of what should be done economically, the PSM has got all these very beautiful theories. I agree with them, frankly. In fact, I should be with them, but I'm not exactly where will I be? <laughs> So, I'm in the DPA and I'm aware of this and I've brought this matter up privately talking to some of my colleagues and they tell me, look, you cannot push it now. Once we are in the seat of power, then no. But then I'm also very skeptical about this. I've, I've, I've seen, I'm a historian by profession. And a lot of these promises made by many of these great party leaders Many countries in Germany and all that, and in the Nazi era, Hitler promised he's going to cut down on capitalism and so on. Ultimately, they backed him, and he took good care of them also when he came to power. I'm not very sure there's going to be much changes. There may be some changes, but don't expect the kind of very, very drastic changes that we all hope for. This is the reality. I'm, I'm realistic enough to see that, you know, I'm very, very disappointed. But, but this is. What I'm facing now. You better be careful of the headlines tomorrow. I think there's a, <laughs> there's a reporter from the Star newspaper uh, in the house tonight. So tomorrow's headline: Arifin Omar wishes he was in the PSM. We can just see, the, we can just see the, the headline. Let's take uh, two or three more from the floor. Now, shyness is not usually a characteristic of our audiences. So. Oh yeah, because I said there's a reporter in the room, everyone suddenly becomes very quiet. <laughs> no, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, come on. <clears throat> can, I, can I respond to ah, something for sure. that? For sure. Okay. That uh, Arifin, Arifin was talked about, which was quite a, uh, what kind of statement was that? No, it's especially if there was a war, if this country was invaded by an external force, who would be defending the country? So it, it, it's been quite a disturbing question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it brings, it brings, brings back to me what happened when the Lahat Tato incident happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, you know, I like to look up all the Amno um, blocks and uh, even the, 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 the military block. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, it's, it's always the Malays who are getting killed or, or in, a, in any kind of defense of the country, etc. Mm -hmm. But if you look at my book on uh, racism and racial discrimination, I have one of the statistics on what the, uh, the ethnic makeup of the armed forces and the civil service was at independence. And what the statistics was at 1971 after May 13. You know, you'd be surprised when I was in school, I mean, when you were in secondary school, the heroes were the, the sportsmen, the athletes, the 100, the 100 meters sprinter is. Is our hero. Everybody's hero. I'm not about the girls' school. No? <laughs> and they are the people, the sprinters and the athletes in our school were the ones who got into the army, the air force. Nobody was shy. Non non Bolivia is not shy when they answer. But well, that's what that's what happened at Lang Dako, the Amno fellows were saying, Oh, these fellows, they don't want to defend the country. Let the Malays die with me. Okay? So that's better than mine. When May 13 happened, when I was in secondary school again, the police, the, the Federal Reserve Unit, the MRU, was first formed. They were dressed in blue. You know, and we used to call them blue boys. And they were made out of the bad hats from the, from the town. And they were all Chinese, practically. 
something in the end, doesn't show. Then we call the, the, the blue boys. And every night they would go around terrorizing the town. Cutting your jeans, but jeans would be cut by doing that time. And if your, your hair is too long, they, will, they have a pair of scissors and they'll cut. And the next day in school, everybody goes, Oh, yesterday in Taiwan Cinema, the FRD will cut this. And all Chinese, few Indians, FRU. Today, do you find FRU uh, uh, with, with any kind of non malay No. But does it mean that the, the non malays were shying away from the police? I don't think so. My neighbor, when I was being detained, when I was first arrested under Operation my neighbor was a Chinese. I don't know whether it's still in there today. But he tell you that after May 13, there were many non mukul uh, police uh, personnel that dropped out. So look at those statistics and then tell me that all the non malays don't want to join the armed forces because they're not prepared to defend the country. No, that's not very true. Yeah, not true. Okay? So that's one. And then you might as well turn around and say, because the composition of the civil service and, and especially the education ministry is mainly Bumi Bushra. Does it mean that the Chinese and the Indians are shying away from education? You know, we have one uh, when we go to meet the education ministry, all the people sitting in the front facing us, from the ministry down to the all who are Bushra. They don't even have a token. No, recently they said, let's have a few tokens. They don't use the word token. <laughs> let's have some Chinese and Indians in the civil service, meaning, meaning in the front. So I think that's, a, that's an important thing to remember. What the statistics was at independence at 71 and now. So one point you have to realize, if you look at the history of this country, the way it has been distorted is shocking. If it weren't for the governments who formed the part of the special branch to bring the main emergency to help destroy the union, the British would have been lost. I'm telling you very much. It was basically Chinese and Indian detectives went undercover to work in the SD and were able to infiltrate the communists and destroy the this part of history is not known. I think the UN tried you know, like, like some, somehow to, to mention it, but it wasn't very, it didn't go in depth. Leon Combo also mentioned, but it was not done in depth. Also. But this part of it should be mentioned and should be recognized. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm so very unhappy with the education system is the way history has been distorted. And I think it's about time that we have to put our foot down and say, you give us a proper history status. Let's do away with this outer nationalistic nonsense. See? Now, I'm sure today there's no mention of Hang Tua, Hang Jabat, and all that. Why suddenly somebody came on the idea they are not going to hear that Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> so I used to joke with friends now, but Hang Tua, Hang Jabat, Hang Kashi, there's Hang Kramat, and Hang Sepat. Is there another headline to watch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now here's, I'm going to announce him, he's, a, he's another... I just got two comments. On this question of fiscal, how is it that the opposition does not have any idea of economic policy, etc., 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 right? My own hypothesis, my own sense, it's not just a question of the fact that who pays them, right? But I think when I look at uh, politics around the world, for me, my experience in Europe, is that Malaysians, Malaysian civil society, Malaysian in general, are too obsessed simply by all this, what I call political. Right? What I call political, right? And there's too much of personality politics here. Okay. And even amongst civil society groups, I do not see many civil society groups who are interested in defense policy, in economic policy. I don't think they are. I mean, how many, which civil society group can you point to that takes an interest in economic policy? I mean, TT. CDP appears, ah, then they begin to jump. 
but in an ordinary situation, who does research? We leave it to the experts, the economics, the economists, right? So there is something about behavior, I mean, I don't know how you call it, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say correct term. Yeah, no, 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 it's not orientation, it's culture, you know, the culture, you know, there's, 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 there's a cultural factor here, right? Uh, it's not cultural. No, I, I, I don't use culture in a narrow sense, right? Because I live in, I live in Taiwan for, two, for more than two years. I mean, civil society groups, people in general, have an interest in economic policy. Right? Come back, wait, that's just one more question. No, 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 that's only, that's, that, 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 that's only one, that, that's, that, that's one point. Second point I want to make is civil service. Civil service. I mean, my, my work, I mean, I mean, all of you know that I was in university years, so, alright? Most of my time, I'm in contact with METI and foreign ministry, alright? It's only in METI and the foreign ministry where you do find non malays right? And always often, they are holding some kind of key positions. Okay? Alright? I'll be honest with you, for many, many years, Malaysia's representative in Geneva for WTO negotiation was always in Okay? So, it only, it's only, and the Malaysian ambassador to Ukraine at the moment is Chinese. But therefore, he's placed that we have to handle all these hard issues. So, <laughs> sure, that's, that's, that's a reality. When they are tough situations in, in positions that are tough, you always have a Chinese or an Indian. Okay? So, they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are limited, in, they are very limited in numbers. But they are, it's only, I can only observe there's only in these two ministries that you have not known. The other ministries are really completely more. More Chinese and more Malays than than than. Yeah. Wisma Putra probably sent the Chinese to Ukraine because they know the life expectancy would be quite short. <laughs> <laughs> Six weeks or something uh, like this. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you went from civil society to civil service. I quite like that. That's nice for. Can I just unpack civil society? Because uh, I, I, I've written, published on meanings of civil society in Southeast Asia, and I think we forget. We think civil society is us, nice, cuddly, progressive, you know, kind of people. No. If you really want to talk about civil society as a kind of, you know, force between the state and the market, etc., etc., there are also lots of right wing ethno chauvinists. Uh, NGOs and representatives of civil society. And by the way, I think on economic policy, the economic liberals, including some organizations where I have friends, like idea, uh, ideas, they call ideas, are actually very proactive. But they're proactive not on uh, Sung's, uh, let's call it modestly, a kind of social democratic type of uh, a reform agenda. They're very pro-economic liberalization. They have lots of forums on signing up to and the benefits of free trade agreements, etc., etc. So I wouldn't say there's a complete vacuum. What I'm suggesting is that in terms of the kind of 19-point program, I quite like this. Woodrow Wilson had how many points, was it? It was also 19 points, I think. <laughs> this is remarkable. <laughs> I mean, 19 is not a regular number, is it? I mean, you know, you could think of like a 10 or a dozen. Huh? You get 17 points. Oh, I think it was 17. I think, I think we're, going to we're going to Google it tonight. I think we're going to say it. Woodrow Wilson meets, uh, you know, Kia Kwa Sung. Right wing groups that are still, you know, sort of within civil society, they're just a rather uncivil branch of civil society. You see what I mean? So I don't think the vacuum is there. And I think that's also part of the struggle, is the struggle of ideas within civil society, across civil society, and of course its relationship to various levels, in, given, given the sort of multi-level nature of the Malaysian polity, from the local to the federal, uh, of, of those kinds of struggles. So I guess I'm talking about why isn't there a uh, an e socio-economic equivalent of something like uh, 
ideas, for example, who dress up their arguments in very nice ways, very rational ways, and so on and so on. Fundamentally flawed. I mean, I write for uh, a magazine to which these two are very closely associated, Penang Monthly. Um, it's quite a good magazine. But every single economics story, and if you remember last month's issue, you know the current one, was TPPA, a brown hand shaking a white hand, or oh, wow, really great graphics, <laughs> written by Penang Institute economists. They are the think tank of the Penang state government. Total neoliberal, unadulterated neoliberal policies. Does that reflect the Penang position? Yes, it does. And does that reflect the DAP position at the national level? What do you mean by Penang position? What Penang position? In relationship to free trade, in relationship to inward investment, and so on. Let's say Penang Institute is the think tank that is the closest to the Chief Minister's office. So I would hardly say that that was not a, a ringing endorsement of what the government believes. I mean, you talked about a cultural policy. And then you wanted in relationship to, come on, heritage and cultural policy is harnessed in Penang to what other portfolio? Tourism. Tourism is all about numbers and bottom line. It's not about sustainability, it's not about quality, it's not about any of those things. It's about how many people we can get off that 9,000 people jumping off a liner for four hours to go around or whatever, those are the bottom line things. It's not about sustainability. It's not about nice people like you and Anne coming up for the jazz festival for a weekend, high quality tourism, because you're just two, two bed nights for two nights. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yes. The tourism and economic tail is wagging, for example, the heritage dog, the, the sustainability and environmental, and they don't care. Have you seen the plans they have for Gurney Drive? Have you seen the plans they have? It's dominated by an eight-lane highway that's going to be, and it's going to be Singapore by the sea. Am I right? Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting. Um, I'm can, big can, can I add something? Yeah, of course. You talk about culture. Let me give you an example. What is Malay culture? Can you tell? In the first place, when you talk, of what is Malay? If you go by the constitutional definition, that is the most nebulous definition of what constitutes a Malay. Because in terms of culture, Malay culture is not really formed. You, you look at Penang. Like, what Malay culture is there? The Borea is no longer there. The Bangsawan is no longer there. What do you have there? It's a deculturalized community. You go to Klantan, the Manora and the DK Barat are there. Why? Islamization, anti-Islam, you kill. What's left on culture? You want to go to Johor? Exactly. So there is really no uniform Malay culture per se. And this is the crux of my argument when I look at the, the tragedy of this country. The problem with the Malay is you can't define it. A Malay is not a race, basically. Because I'm a Malay. But if I go to Kanda, they don't look upon me as a Malay because I'm different from them. And if a country goes to Johor, he will not be accepted. You know? And if you go to Indonesia, the Malay that you talk to may be a Christian. He may even be a Hindu or a Buddhist. It's only in this country that you are tied to Islam. And I think that is the major impediment and a great problem. Because of that, you get what I call instant Magini Malays. <laughs> Guys, you suddenly master the national language whose, whose father came from Kerala I know I can become a Malayu woman. <laughs> this is the reality that we face. You know? And this is the problem. So when you look at the race policies in this country, basically it is being kept alive and it will be kept alive for the, for the convenience and benefit of this group of people who make use of Malayism to ensure that their pockets are alive. This has always been my argument. There is no such thing as a Malay race. This, this is the reality of it now. No, it's only a human race, anyway. Anyway, did you know he's actually Filipino? It's not Malay at all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to explain why? <laughs> no, I need to explain. I mean, okay, fine. If you look at it this way, how do I look at my ancestry? My grandmother is Spanish, Roman Catholic, and so is my mother. My father is Archimedes. See? But born here. My mother came here, she chose the wrong time. Just after she came, the Japanese came. 
<laughs> you couldn't go back to one of the things. And if she was thinking of going to the place, there's no point. Everyone in her family is no longer alive. And your kid, Anila, was destroyed. And no survivors in my family. I should stay here and make a home for herself. See, this is a relative. And my mother is a Roman Catholic. So you see, at that point in time, when my father married my mother, there was no need for her to convert. For the very simple reason, Penang did not have religion. That came about in 1995 when the great, magnificent Kosovun changed the constitution and made Islam the state religion. You see, what a great favor he's done. And this is the reality of the world. So, today when you look at what constitutes a Malay, a Malay is actually a, a mixture of so many groups, diverse groups. It's not a race in itself. It's just a mixture. And a Malay identity is United States, very plural, liberal and open. Not the kind of close-minded, exclusive identity that is now being promoted by AMNO in order to make sure that the so-called Malays get everything and the rest are disenfranchised. And this is what I'm fighting to nail and claw. To nail and claw. Very good. Uh, let's take one or two more last questions and before I ask Sung and Arifin to Wrap up for us, anyone? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, question for so. Right, um, actually, uh, 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 what, what do you think about the prospect or how to develop strategy for the uh, civil society or the movement to push forward the agenda of reform? I don't think we can rely on the established political parties now for reform. And uh, always the political parties will pick up whatever popular from the demand for the people. And that the, the set you see the leadership of the first day sitting in the bandwagon of all the politicians who want to be carried off. So it's a, a, person, a, 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 a person, but not the, the system itself. I think it's quite a, a lot of the people, of, especially younger generations, are very really upset with what happened. Because first day is supposed to be a, 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 the, 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 well, the leading movement now in Malaysia, but the leadership has taken the, the position that jumping on the bandwagon. It should be the politician who ride on the bandwagon of the movement. I remember the time, it was quite a long time ago, Sora always uh, taking the, the leadership in building the movement, talking about the building. But now what, what happened and how we move forward from, from here to develop a strategy or movement that can bring forward this, the, the, the reform, forcing the politician to jump on our bandwagon, not Yes. Good, I'll take one more, one or two more if there is a burning question. Um, I'm going to ask Arifin to go first so you have the last question. Uh, can you repeat your question? Who was the first question? Well, the first question was about strategy. Oh, okay, fine. Strategies, I think we cannot rely anymore on the parties. I'll be very frank with you. They sort of been caught in a rut. And for them to get out of the rut is next to impossible. I think civil societies have got a greater leeway. And not only that, I think civil society can transcend ethnic divide and also religious divide. It depends on how, how well they pitch themselves. But the moment you get into a political party, you'll be sort of straight jacket into a situation where you can't move. And, and this is what I'm beginning to see happening in Malaysia. Now, the second question of how democratic Parties are, okay? You are asking me whether parties are. Uh, you are looking in terms of the DDP. I, I can only answer you in one, one way. Have you read Michel's The Iron Law of Oligarchy? If you read Michel's political parties, he wrote a book on political parties and he talks of the Iron Law of Oligarchy, that will give you an answer to your question. There is basically precious little democracy in any party, political party. Most of the decisions are made by a small group at the top. This is the reality of it. In every political party, whether it's AMLO, whether it's the MC or the DAP or even the PAS, I often wondered how PAS can make such pronouncement and get away with it. He has next to absolute power in the party. That's why he can get away with some of the stupid things that he says. You see? Is that it? And what's the last question? Uh, there's more on the economic policy, economic and fiscal policy of Penang. And that's the first one that's why you need any candidates. Oh, room for third party independent candidates. Well, I don't think that's going to work out at all. 
I don't think so. Only in rare cases that may happen, but more often than not, it doesn't work. So before I uh, hand over to Song for the last word, uh, Arifin, in a very brief way, what would you, what would your main reflection be, therefore, on uh, the recent declaration and? your own both tactical and longer term strategic response to it. Okay, frankly, being a member of the party, I have no choice but to fall behind. To say that, okay, I'll go along. But I have very, very grave reservations with certain individuals involved in the declaration, in particular Mahathir. The only reason why he's going back to work with us is because he realizes on his own as precious little we can achieve. It's a marriage of convenience. So, I can't really say that we may succeed. I think that what will finally bring Najib down must be a combination of internal and external factors. Foreign pressure getting more and more untenable, and that he's become such an embarrassment internationally that he has to step down. He's gone to Saudi Arabia much too often. Perhaps you may wonder why he's there. I have talked to a few of the Amro fellows. That may be the only country in this land that is willing to offer him political asylum. And it was the only country, God for second country on this planet that offered Idi Amin political asylum. Good company. So, I'm not surprised that he gets political asylum from Saudi Arabia. Okay, so party discipline on the one hand, but the right to be critical even within party discipline. You've got the quote for tomorrow's evening. And of course the last word will go to Sol. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I think my, my very first book I wrote, uh, that, that I think uh, Garrett talked about, was called Class and Communalism in Malaysia, my, my PhD thesis, which I updated uh, into uh, race, racism and racial discrimination in Malaysia. Because I think that a lot of problems in any country in the world, uh, the policies you have that you put forward in an election, the, the, even the slogans that you have, you know, whether it's Lamakan Malaysia or whether it's Reform Malaysia, is actually the what what was the class that is leading the campaign? You know, who are, who are leading the DAP? Who are leading the civil society? You know, so I mean, this question about what should be the, the, the role of, of civil society at this moment. Uh, we've seen the two, I, 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 I've done a historical survey of all this kind of stuff. First say what the, what the demands were, first say one, two, three, four. And even this kind of stuff. Now the biggest, I find that a, a, a fissure is, is, is appearing now uh, in civil society. Uh, this question of working with Mahathir, whether it's Salamat Khan, whether it's saving Malaysia, or whether you want something more than that. And I think, I mean, for, for once, I can see different voices coming up, which, which wasn't there. In civil society, I find other, other people besides me writing to put up a different point of view. But you'd be surprised, in, in many circles, in, in, in our e-group, there are many people who, 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 who disagree with me. But what, what, do, they, what do they want? What did the, who the DAP leadership want? What did the Pakatan Harapan people want? What does Anwar want? Suddenly I feel that Anwar is fortunate, fortunate being put away. Because if he had forced to put his, his, his position on 1998 financial crisis or on uh, the present crisis, it would be on the TPPA. What would Anwar's position be? So it depends on, on, on the, the, the class as leading this, this, this campaign. But it's, it's a matter of time. It's, it's, it's a question of how we fight it. It's a question of how we put forward these, these demands. You know? But every, every election I, 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 I'm concerned about, I, I show you how from the 1986 election up to today, <laughs> I'm pushing this kind of stuff. Sometimes you think that you've, 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 uh, you've, 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 you've hit something. And you know it doesn't seem to, to, to have hit something. So it's, it's a question that more people are coming up to, to, to do things, and more people pushing forward. Uh, a, a third force, 
question about independence standing up for elections, uh, I don't think it's stand a chance. But in, since the last two elections, I have argued in the, in the online press about why there's a need for a third force. And there has to be a third force that is prepared to go against the neoliberal policies of, of Pakatan and Harapan. Not otherwise. And I think there was a big debate I was having with uh, Raja Petra and Harris Ibrahim in the in MCLM, or whatever they call it, the Civil Liberties Movement. Because they were not putting forward an, an, an alternative of that kind. They were just saying, let's have a, a third force. Third force is, is, is just a block, you know, a blur. We don't know what the third force wants. But I argue that the third force has to be a, a third force that is going beyond neoliberal policies. You know? So I think I will answer the questions. Uh, okay, so it all remains to be seen. But I think this, this, this question that we started with, Slamakan Malaysia or reforming Malaysia? Whether we're prepared to accept Amati as a leadership or we're going to push for something more. I think this, this is, is, is the beginning of something new. I hope. Thank <laughs> you.